We have a guest joining us in studio. Uh, she is joining us from Trip Family Medicine here in Twin Falls, and that is, of course, physician assistant Lauren Bostrom. And uh, this is what your third visit with us, I think. I, I think it's my third or fourth one already with your you. Your third third solo yeah, visit, maybe. It's my second solo. So. Okay. Uh, well, so. you know, you get to be a pro after one time with this. <laughs> Uh, it, it, the first couple of times, you know, there's that jihad of the sound. And then after a while, it's just like, oh, look what I've got to be today. Uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about vaping this morning, uh, which has become for a lot of people an alternative to smoking. People who may have one time smoked cigarettes or maybe they smoke cigars. Uh, they have now, a lot of them moved over to vaping because they believe it might be healthier uh, than uh, than actually inhaling tobacco. Uh, we're at 8.30, call it 8.35, and it's 17 right now. Bill Colley with you as well, answering telephones this morning on News Radio 1310, KLIX, and News Radio 1310.com. We were just talking off air about this, and I was sharing a story of one of my former co workers who was actually he was trying to get away from smoking cigarettes. So he took up vaping as he hoped a way to sort of wean himself slowly uh, in that direction, but he would be vaping in the workplace. And eventually he was told, don't do that. You've got to stop. Even though his argument was, I'm not leaving a cloud of smoke. And he worked in a room where he was alone in the office. And so even though there may have been a little bit of the vapor that escaped from his, uh, I don't know, it looks like a pipe that he was smoking. Yeah. Uh, but it wasn't smoking, but he was inhaling on that. And uh, I think in the college days they called that toking. But that's from <laughs> something else they were smoking. But he was told you can't do it. They just said, we're going to have a blanket policy. And so... He felt that he was uh, that, that 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 was actually running against his opportunity to try and reduce his cravings, but we don't simply know about the dangers yet, do we? Yes, and and that's exactly true. So overall, they have said um, that we really don't know long term the effects that vaping can have. Um, the products that are in in vaping, um, the the main ones are glycerol and um, polyethyl. Um, glycol as well as the flavoring, but they have found um, traces of heavy metals as well. Um, and even the, the main products in there, they may sound kind of harmless, they sound like sugar, um, but they they have they do get break, broken down and they can potentially be carcinogenic. And we really, vaping has only been in the United States since 2007. Um, we really haven't been able to study long-term the risk on our population as far as cancers. Um, there's been some pretty small studies done so far um, where they, they see that um, they test the lung function in someone who, who vaped compared to someone who smoked a cigarette, um, and both show signs of obstruction. So it, it's not harmless um, from a lung standpoint. Um, but it, 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 the truth is it does contain less nicotine and, and less to toxins that, than a cigarette does. And, and the, there's not really too many dangers of secondhand uh, that you know, when I was a younger guy, and I remember restaurants first started. A lot of them did this before governments got involved. Started eliminating because you know, you'd, I would take my daughter to Pizza Hut, and they'd have a smoking section and a non-smoking. Which, I'm sorry, but uh, you know that uh, you walk in and the, the smoke doesn't know that there's a divider. The smoke, somebody could be sitting on one side of the restaurant; it's going to drift to the other side. But with vaping, the, the vapor that actually comes out is really confined to a small area, so. There's not a lot of danger that someone in a restaurant sitting 50 feet away would be picking this up. You know, um, they really don't know at this point. And so it, it's the big unknown because there really hasn't been a lot of studies. And so um, really as um, far as the the research goes, we can't safely say that e-cigarette use in, in a restaurant isn't going to cause harm to the people around them either. So most restaurants, I'm sure, have already put policies in place while we sit and see what's ultimately going to happen with us. Yep, and it may take years of research down the road here to see, um, but um, they, they have found studies where people around, um, people have complained about coughing because of inhaling the, the vapor that someone else has um, exhaled. And we've really, um, overall, my, my, my point is, um, we don't really know a whole lot about the safety. And so the, the best thing we can do if you're someone who is smoking um, is really to quit smoking and right now using the FDA-approved methods to quit smoking at this point. Now, some of us had an easier time. I, I didn't smoke a lot. I liked cigars when I was younger, and I'd smoke cigarettes sometimes with friends. Looking back on it, I don't know why, but I just stopped one day, and I never never picked up, and that was 20-some years ago, and I've never picked up a cigarette or cigar since then. But uh, when we say to people, you know, you got to quit, uh, a lot of people out there, I was telling you about another friend who, 
uh, even after bypass surgery, was having a difficult time quitting. And actually, he was thinking about vape, vaping, that it would be better. But some people can walk away from it like I did, obviously. And some people, on the other hand, uh, I had a neighbor who, after he lost one lung, he couldn't stop. He kept smoking after that. And so I understand. Maybe we can talk a little bit more about this. We got a, I, I just looked at my clock. We've got a break coming up. But Lauren Bostrom is a physician assistant at Trip Family Medicine. Uh, she's joining us in studio until 9 o'clock this morning. We're at a balmy 18 right now. Well, Lauren actually used to live in Minnesota. This is what they call summertime. Uh, we've got more on the way in just a few minutes on KLIX. We're talking with Lauren Bostrom today from Trip Family Medicine. She's a physician assistant uh, joining us in the studio. And we're talking about vaping and how, for a lot of people, it may be a bridge to smoking cessation. On the other hand, it still has some issues, potential issues. And uh, We're at 842, and it's 18. Bill Colley with you as well on Top Story. On News Radio 1310, KLIX, News Radio 1310.com. Telephone number to reach the show today. If you've got a question or comment about this, it's 208 736 0300. That's 208 736 0300. I do want to point out as well if you want to email me a question, bill.colley at townsquaremedia.com, which is how Lauren sent me the note about the topic for today. She was about 24 hours sooner than a lot of her co workers. <laughs> Not that I'm saying. Um, but she, she was prepared. Uh, not that they aren't. I'm just saying that you were on the ball with this because I got a chance to look at this last night, and that's why I had some thoughts about it. We have a caller with us, and caller, uh, you're on the air. Uh, go ahead. You know, this might be an obvious thing to, to say or think, but I, you know, when I was in junior high school, I smoked a little bit, but that was all just to be part of the group. You know, as I've grown up, I thought, why would anybody want to put something other than the crappy air we already breathe in their lungs? It just doesn't make just doesn't make any sense to me. Well, we're dealing with peer pressure mainly for younger people, right? Yeah, and that's um, one of the big concerns with e-cigarettes is um, it's starting to make a rise in our younger population. Um, when in 2011, they said about 1.5 percent of high schoolers were using e-cigarettes. That went up to about 13 percent by 2014. Um, and what they found most um, e-cigarette users are also still using cigarettes. So this potentially is kind of a, a gateway um, mm-hmm. and kind of normalizes a lot of the big campaigns they've had against smoking. Um, so kind of going back to when you think about, I think about a lot of my um, elderly patients who said, you know, we just had no idea how bad this was for us. And um, I am, I'm concerned that maybe that's going to be the the fate of the e-cigarette. Maybe it, it will be found to be safer um, in the long run, but we really don't know at this point. And, and we could be seeing our high school or population um, down the road 70 years from now with lung cancer and um, possibly organ damage from from things in, in this vaping substance that we don't really know um, that it could cause in the long term. We've got another caller. Caller, you're on the air on KLIX on uh, Better Health. Go ahead. Good morning, Lauren. Good morning. The U.S. Navy has banned vaping on, I think it's all ships, but it may just be submarines. So have they determined whether there's a health issue or a possible explosion issue with the with the device there i'll listen to your own phone um so as far as um the research that i've done there's again not a whole lot out there um but they have said um there's been a lot of emergency room visits from people suffering burns from vaping um there's been kids who have run into the cartridges and and um and ate them and and have had toxic issues from that um as far as um long-term effects um they have found reduced lung function in people who do vape um, immediately following vaping. Um, our long-term studies are, again, very limited because this is a product that's only been here um, for about 10, 10, 11 years here. And so cigarette um, use, usually we see um, more effects. People feel fine until a lot longer down the road when, when it starts to catch up with them on the lung function. I want to thank him for the call. I was mentioning in, in the last segment uh, walking into one of these vaping stores with a a friend of mine, uh, and he had had uh, bypass surgery done, and was told not to smoke anymore. So he, but he was having trouble, and he thought that this might be a safer alternative, at least on the on his road to eventually quitting. And we walked in, and I, my comment to you off air was, it looked like a candy store with all of these flavors, like fruit flavors and various flavors that they they make available. I think that's where the young people are attracted by this because you start maybe chewing gum. 
They had a dentist, by the way, who used to get so upset with anybody who chewed gum. Uh, but they started by chewing gum, and all of a sudden you're 15, and I guess that's, this is considered to be cool. And uh, and to sit there and say, well, it's fruit flavored, you know, is better than saying, well, it's just a smoking piece of tobacco. Yeah. So, I mean, it, by flavoring it, they have been able to kind of reduce that stigma of using it. Um, I, it's for kids a, an easy way for them to go from, I'm just doing an e cigarette, tastes fine. Um, but most of these products contain nicotine. And um, then that's an easy progression to, to using cigarette smoking, too, that we know the long term effects of. Um, and it doesn't take a whole lot of use of cigarettes to, to raise your risk of heart attack either. So I have a lot of patients going, you know, I only smoke one cigarette a day. Studies show just one to four cigarettes a day increase your risk of heart disease by three times the fold of someone who doesn't smoke. I know that uh, I remember hearing a story a few years ago about uh, a couple of famous athletes who chewed tobacco. Baseball players, of course, it was part of the culture for a long, long time, but even younger ball players who were coming down with face cancers. And people would say, well, you know, chewing tobacco keeps your mouth from drying out on the field and it's not as dangerous as smoking a cigarette. Clearly, though, there were dangers with it. And, and I guess that's part of the concern about vaping. Even if it, it isn't as damaging to the lungs, perhaps, that it could still be a cause of, uh, of oral cancer and that type of thing. Yeah, we, we really don't know what kinds of um, um, adverse effects it's going to have. Um the, I mean, the truth is there is less nicotine um, in, in vaping. It's usually between 0 to 30 um, micrograms in, in a puff um, of vape. Um, so that means you have to do about 30 puffs to equal one cigarette, which is about one milligram of nicotine on average. Um, but with all the other chemicals used in it, we, we just don't know. And so one of the big things um, I do want to talk about is a little bit of, of the ways that we we have approval for quitting smoking. Because um, the FDA has not yet said e-cigarettes is, is a device tool that we can market as a smoking cessation tool. It's marketed as a recreational one right now. Right, right, right. And there's a difference mm -hmm. between vaping and e-cigarettes, right, uh, to some degree? Um, I, overall, it's a term kind of used interchangeably between the two. But um, there can be some differences? Um, it's more the type of device that's used by the chemicals used in, in either two are, are overall generally the same every um Every you have to be careful when you buy a product if you are someone who does use e-cigarettes or vaping um, to look and see what's in it because um, there's variations in everything that they're marketing right now. How about these people who chew the nicotine gum or wearing a patch? Would that be a safer alternative, let's say, than vaping? Um, so that's FDA regulated um, with the amount of nicotine that's put in there. Um, we know um, we know about the ingredients in there. We know about their long-term effects. And so that's one of the ways that um, that um, can assist people with quitting smoking. Sure. Um, the other ones out there, um, Chantex is a common one. Um, probably one of the ones that we see a little bit more success with, um, but also a lot more people who can't tolerate the medication because um, there are some side effects with it. Um, and there's another med medication called Zyban, um, which is also known as Wellbutrin. Um, that has been shown to be successful in helping people quit smoking. I, I just, uh, you know, I, I think back to when, when I stopped, and as I say, I didn't have the problems that a lot of people have. Uh, within a few days, I didn't really think about it. But the strange thing was, about two years later, I dreamed I was smoking. Uh, and, and so these things still crop up with people. And I think that a lot of people I've talked to tell me that it was 18 months to three years before they finally, after, and a lot of them went cold turkey, but it was that long before perhaps... Some people a week passes. Other people it takes a couple of years for those cravings. That that that, that addiction is so strong. Um, and it's strong. And for a lot of people, um, people get concerned about the withdrawal effects. Um, that's usually only a few days, but it's a lot of it can be the habit of of it. Um, and so there's different reasons that um, people smoke, and sometimes it's out of boredom. Um, sometimes it's because of anxiety, and and sometimes um, that's one of the things to to look at too, if you're trying to quit smoking, is, is my anxiety or um, under control right now? Because if it's not, you might be more successful if you're able to address that that at the same time that you're trying to quit smoking too. One of my former co-workers uh, had been a, a Harrier jet pilot in the Marine Corps and, uh, and he had left af active duty after eight years and he was working with me in television and one day I saw him smoking and I remember saying to him something along the lines of, how do you Marines, you guys are running all the time. What are you doing smoking a cigarette? And he says, I'm a pilot. We don't run. Um, but, you know, there's 
there's still we talk a little bit about peer pressure and some cultural norms, uh, and and we're just a- I think adding to that when it comes to e-cigarettes, the vaping, because it, it's it's become normalized, if you will. Uh, it, it seemed exotic at first, and that was the attraction for a lot of people. But now that it's almost as normalized as let's say cigarette smoking was 50 years ago. Even if we said tomorrow we're not going to sell these, if someone said they're banned, there's going to be a trade in this, I'm sure. And so you're still going to be dealing with patients coming in with these issues for years to come. Yep. And um, I, it's, I really, I'm not quite sure how, how this is all going to play out in the long term. Um, and, and I know there are people who do successfully quit smoking um, using these. And um, if you are able to, that's great. But they have found long term so far that most people trying to use these ex- e-cigarettes um, tend to to not, you tend to kind of keep smoking cigarettes. Um, so they have reduced number of cigarettes a day, um, but they're still not fully off of them. That's like when the, 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 there was that period, I know when I was younger, where people were switching from regular cigarettes to what were called, I guess, a light cigarette. Maybe I've got the wrong word for that. But I worked for a fellow uh, many, many years ago, and I used to always be amazed he could smoke four or five packs of cigarettes a day but he had to use his voice in radio and television. And I used to watch him after he switched to these these lighter cigarettes. He would finish one, and he would be lighting the second one off of it while he was on a smoking break. He would stand outside the building and one after another. Um, and unfortunately, he passed away at 60 years old from cancer a couple of years ago. Uh, it, it, the struggle here still gets back to that point that for some of these people— they're never going to be able to walk away from it once they've actually started. I, I would imagine that that's, as, as a friend of mine told me who worked for the American Cancer Society once, said something to the effect of, if we outlawed cigarettes tomorrow, people would be breaking into houses to try to find tobacco or, or ways to buy illicit tobacco. Uh, he said it would be like any other drug addiction that people have that forces them to do bad things. And it's a hard habit to quit. And if you're struggling but motivated, um, I encourage people to see the provider and if you're someone worried um, because you've had a heavy um, smoking history, and it is the number one of our number one killers in the United States is lung cancer, um, some of the, one of the newer guidelines that that came out recently is um, CT scans for people who've had um, a history of smoking. Um, it has to come out to 30 pack years. So pack years are number of cigarettes, um, pack, how many packs a day you smoke, times years you've smoked. Um, if it's over 30 and you're between the ages of 50 five to 80, um, you would probably qualify for a yearly CT scan to, to check to see if you have any signs of lung cancer. I don't mean to make light of this, but when my brother, he's been dead now uh, for almost eight years, uh, when he was dying of cancer, they told him, they estimated he had four months to go, and his doctor told him to quit smoking, and he said, what for? And I think that we hear that a lot out of people too, because I think the doctor's thought is maybe there can be some sort of, you know, if not miraculous cure a way that this we can work around this, but that's the other part of it. You're dealing with people who then feel the fatalism, and, um, and and they're just going to continue doing it. Well, the the point of um, approving these screenings is to hopefully catch people early on in the disease progress, so we can treat this lung disease and catch it before it is stage four cancer, um, where there maybe isn't a lot of treatment options out there. Right. Um, and so um, I, I know a lot of people kind of say, kind of go, you know, I have someone who lived. My grandpa lived to be 90, and he smoked a lot every day. Um, but it doesn't mean that we're we're immune to it either. And so I, I just encourage people if um, if you are smoking um, and um, don't want to have your life end early, um, and maybe be able to catch something that's preventable, um, see your provider again to kind of do some lung to do a lung cancer screen and maybe talk about quitting smoking. Um, they say if you quit before the age of 50, you get about 10 years of your life back. I just remember watching as a kid a TV commercial where George Burns would be smoking a cigar in his easy chair and there was a machine next to him that would, would was like a vacuum that would pull in the smoke and that and he was he was the pitchman for the device. And of course he lived to be a hundred years old and was known perhaps along with Groucho Marx as being the biggest cigar smoker. But they may have had exceptional genes. It, that was really what it was all about. Yeah, genetics play a huge part um in a lot of um disease processes. So um some people may be more prone to developing um, cancer, but you could be even a light smoker and and still be at risk for developing lung cancer as well. And um, it's um, I, I just really strongly encourage people if you're thinking about it, um, take the first step and, and and talk to a provider, get yourself mm-hmm. um, 
get that, you get yourself the help you need, and sometimes that accountability can be helpful to you. For people who are looking to get in touch with you or your colleagues at the office, how do they go about doing that? Sure. So um, we are located at 1411 Fillmore Street, um, right next to Gold's Gym. Um, our phone number is 933-4400, and um, there's four of us at the office. I'm one of the only females, if you need to get away from the testosterone, but we have Jeremy Russell <laughs> and Dr. Tripp out there, too, and we all work very closely together. But you all like football. I mean, that seems to be the unifying force in that office. We don't like the same teams, though, so that's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we've got to point out that that works out well, though, because the doctor can go to Gold's Gym and then just head over to the office uh, yeah. mornings. Yeah, um, a lot of the providers are out there. I, I, you may not find me there, but I, I tend to run outside. So. <laughs> yeah, even, even well, being a Minnesotan, that's running outside even when it's five below is probably not an issue. I had a school <laughs> teacher who'd grown up in Buffalo, and uh, he, I would some mornings look outside on a winter day, and he would be running uh, outside even when it was still dark out. And if it was uh, below zero, he'd just have a mask over his face, and that was how he handled it. So. Uh, he did. He did not allow cold weather to deter him. And when you live in a cold part of the country, if you do, well, you're like throwing in the towel in that situation. Exactly. I've I've ran a couple of times. I'm not as hardcore as I was when I was younger. But <laughs> <laughs> well, we want to thank Lauren Bostrom for joining us this morning. We'll see you in the rotation probably in a few weeks again. Yes. Thank you for having me. Sure. And Trip Family Medicine, as she pointed out on Fillmore Street, that's also on the north side of town, directly across from the main post office. And remember, life's too short not to feel good. We're coming up on 9 o'clock. The news is just ahead from the Fox News Channel on News Radio 1310 KLIX and NewsRadio1310.com.